Okay, uh, this presentation is on lessons learned with CFS. Uh, we're in this presentation going to first start off by introducing who we are. Uh, then we're going to sort of get into an overview of our both software and hardware architectures, then sort of dig into our software uh, uh, build system and tooling, and then present some of our uh, proposals and conclusions uh, that we've uh, learned as we've been working with CFS. So Reflex Aerospace was founded in uh, 2021 uh, with the objective of building uh, medium-sized satellites in the 100 to 200, uh, 500 kilogram range. Uh, we are currently set to launch our first mission uh, this fall. Uh, the representatives on uh, this presentation are from the flight software team. Uh, the team consists of about uh, 10 software engineers, most of which have previous uh, experience doing flight software and even some with uh, CFS experience. Uh, in our uh, flight software, we're using quite a bit of open source software and we've even made some uh, contributions upstream uh, to RTEMS as well as CFS. Uh, we're developing our flight software uh, from scratch based on these different open source uh, tools uh, against some in-house developed avionics. So the objective of this is to get into our uh, experiences we've been bringing up CFS. Uh, our experience so far has been mostly positive, but it wasn't really ready to go right out of the box. Uh, it wasn't sort of something that could be compiled and run, and it took quite a bit of uh, learning to figure out how to configure and build uh, CFS. Uh, as, and some of that did have some specific pain points that we wanted to highlight and get into in this presentation, as well as proposing some uh, suggestions on how to make that a little bit easier uh, in the future. So before we get into the software, it kind of makes sense to give a little bit of an overview of the uh, avionics box that we're targeting. It consists of two different uh, types of cards. Uh, one is a high-speed peripheral card and the other is for low-speed peripherals. Uh, in both cases, we have a TMS-570 that features as a board manager that checks the health of the board. And then we have another processor that does the more functional portion of the card. Uh, for the low-speed peripherals, that's a, another TMS-570. For the high-speed, it's a Zinc Ultrascale Plus. Uh, in all cases, the flight software is really running on the R5s on those uh, processors. So for the TMS, that's the only processor in it. But in the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus, there's also an A53 uh, that we're using for payload processing, but not for the main flight software, largely because it doesn't have any sort of uh, redundancy uh, with a, a lock step core. Uh, the boards communicate to each other uh, over a, an Ethernet bus. So one of the challenges is actually getting all of these different third-party integrations to actually uh, work well together. Uh, so we've got a variety of different tool chains to build against the different processors and uh, different uh, libraries that we're making use of. And they all generally have their own sort of build systems that they like to use uh, and different ways of configuring them. So getting that all to come together in a set of binaries that can be flown on an avionics box is uh, a pretty significant challenge. Another challenge uh, is the fact that, again, we have a variety of different targets, uh, target platforms. So we've got a couple different uh, operating systems. We have RTEMS for the main fly software, uh, Linux for just doing uh, on a PC sort of testing and uh, higher level uh, development. Uh, we're also running Peta Linux, which functions more or less just like regular Linux once you've got it built. Uh, that's running on the A53s for some uh, payload processing stuff. Um, the flight software is really mostly just based on C. Uh, there's some Python tooling. Uh, but the actual code that's running is really all C, except for a little bit of Python on the eight cores uh, for doing some payload processing. 
So one of the main advantages and driving points to picking CFS is because of its software bus, as well as of its uh, software bus network application. Uh, this allows us to do sort of a modular design, uh, which uh, makes the development a lot easier with a larger size team. Uh, it, and then with the software bus network, that takes it a little bit further, and it also makes it easier to coordinate all of the messages between uh, all of the different processors in a really transparent way. Uh, and since we have a variety of different processors and processor types, uh, this is a very big advantage. Uh, a lot of that is going over Ethernet, but we do have a couple of UARTs in there uh, for communicating to the uh, board platform processors, uh, as well as for communication, as well as an IPI uh, interface between the APU and the RPU on internal to the Xilinx uh, Ultrascale Plus. Uh, another big advantage is all of this communication is CCSDS, which is uh, pretty much standard for our uh, uh, radio as well as our ground station. Uh, so with that, um, I can pass this off to Stanislav, who will now get into uh, the build system. Yep, thanks, Philip. I am going to present uh, a summary of uh, the bring up activities that we uh, did here at Reflex and also present um, on the build system design that we ended up uh, using. So overall, it was been a several months of um, RTMC and CFS bring up work which uh, was work around uh, BSP, also build system tools and configuration. There has definitely been a learning curve for many of us. Some of us have, um, they had uh, previous experience with uh, CFS, and so the second time went faster. The solution we ended up using is de facto cloning and owning CFS with a big uh, parent flight software repository, which we call user space software, connecting the CFS repository as a submodule. Doing it this way, we still maintain enough flexibility to pull from upstream. Next slide. Here are some numbers about how we maintain the fork of CFS. There is a moderate number of commits, and every time we make a modification, we leave an RFX, which means reflex mark, which helps us to distinguish the comments made by our team from the comments made by the previous uh, CFS uh, development. These numbers do not include the stats from the CFS apps and configs that are now in our user space. Next slide. In total, we have had five bring up challenges and they are related to the CFS build system, the CFS configuration, um, defining what is CFS core and what could be removed finding a good interface between ground and flight and uh, configuring the CFS apps for the use in the user space. One challenge with the CFS configuration has been to make it fit on a small microcontroller. And um, when it comes to different components of the CFS, we are still considering which of them we are going to use and which of them will be removed. Next slide. Now about the build system. There were two decisions that we had to make. One of them was whether we would develop within CFS or we will make it a submodule. The second one was related to deciding whether we would merge all the CFS open source repositories to just one or we would keep them separate just as they are maintained on GitHub. Next slide. Related to this, is um, that we saw three possible approaches for cloning CFS. The first of them was to develop everything within the CFS parent repository, maintaining the existing open source scheme. And with this design, we would have all the user apps and the configuration developed within the parent CFS repository. So all the open source structure stays the same, and we try to develop our software within this structure. The approach number two actually introduces a user space repository, which is apparent to the CFS repository. And in this configuration, the CFS repository becomes a submodule. All apps are taken out from the CFS and are maintained in the user space. 
as well as the configuration. With the approach number three, it's uh, similar to the approach number two, but the difference is mm, that the CFS build system is discarded and a custom build system is recreated for CFS in user space so that there is only one user space build system linking to the CFS uh, source code. Next slide. Our approach was to use the approach number two with a long-term plan to maybe migrate to the approach number three. So our user space repository includes a separate submodule with CFS. We have merged all the CFE, PSP, OSAL into one repository, and all CFS apps were moved to the user space because literally every app had to be customized. In total, we now have three CMake trees, two of the CFS and one of the parent user space repository. We still maintain the CPU 123 configuration in the CFS, but all the tool chains and the configurations they are provided from the parent user space repository. The parameters that we use in the user space are much more sophisticated. So we don't just have the CPU platforms, but we had to customize it to work with uh, generation. For example, development boards, engineering models, flight models, uh, the computer roles within our Avionix architecture and the redundancy roles, so primary or backup. Uh, next slide. The automation that we do is all in Python. We do not use Bash and we minimize scripting that could be done otherwise in CMake. In Python, we have all the tasks that are shared by the development team, which means building, testing, flashing, and an analysis, um, many other things. Uh, TMS, sorry, TMTC toolchain is also written in Python, as well as the integration test, which we based on PyTest. For building tasks, we use invoke. So there is just one build target task where we specify a configuration that we want to build. And then under the hood, it calls into CMake trees of the user space and the CFS. We removed dynamic linking. We use static linking. We removed the startup script file. And currently, um, we are calling directly into the CFE API to create each app. We also use Ccache to speed up recompilation. Next slide. This is a small demonstration. It shows an earlier version of our invoke tasks for building CFS and the user space software. On, on the, so that the first task is building CFS. It's calling to the CMake of uh, CFS. And then this one is used by the second build target task, which first builds CFS and then links the CFS produced artifacts into the user space build system. Just with this task, we can um, somehow solve the problem of three CMake trees to be called one from each other. And with this, I turn it to Adrian. So after the build system uh, uh, content by my colleague, I will uh, cover the configuration. So the first piece of configuration is uh, the tool chain, which defines um, yeah, the compiler and, and flags used for each CFS uh, target. And in our case, when using CFS as a submodule, sub we found it hard to share the compilation flags from the parent uh, repository. And uh, the reason for that is that CFS uh, build system um, executes the, the CMake from Bash instead of including it as a CMake tree. And so all the CMake um, configuration is, is uh, lost. Um, the second point that uh, was a bit uh, challenging at first is the, ta the targets.cmake file, which uh, defines for CFS um, the different systems and platforms. Um, so containing the processor ID, the list of applications to 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 link uh, and so on and these those uh, variables are created um, dynamically and and that makes it quite hard to follow uh, what's what's happening and and to debug and so uh, a, a more explicit configuration uh, such as a key value dictionary would would make it e easier to to have a good over, over, overview and also to understand how, how the CMake uh, uh, system uh, works um, next, the configuration of CFS as a, as a flight, flight software. Um, so there are several sources of configuration for CFS. The first one, as I just mentioned, is in uh, the, the CMake. 
Um, second one uh, comes from the OSAL uh, module, which uh, auto -gen -gen generates header files from, uh, from uh, CMEC. And then the last one is uh, in CFE, um, the platform config uh, header file, which contains uh, a lot of defines um, that actually configures uh, CFS. And so all of those uh, sources of config configuration makes uh, CFS feels very scattered and uh, and is a bit uh, a bit confusing uh, and yeah makes it a bit hard to find a given uh, configuration. Um, the second uh, point, um, the CFE way of using D, uh, defines um, requires a lot of recompilation. Uh, so each time we change a parameter, we need to recompile the full uh, CFS. Uh, and we also need one full compilation tree for each CFS uh, CPU target. And so all, all of this takes a lot of time and uses a lot of uh, disk space. And uh, one way to, to avoid this would be to use uh, a global variable to hold the, config, the configuration. Um, this could be a, a const uh, a struct to, to make sure that it's uh, um, read-only. Um, and so this would allow to compile uh, only one single CFS library and then um, at link time, link it with a different configuration file for each of the CPU uh, targets. Um, the last bit of configuration that we found a bit uh, challenging is that CFS by default uses uh, a few megabytes of, of RAM, um, which is, uh, yeah, of course, perfectly fine if, if you have gigabytes of RAM. But in our case, we have a, quite a low RAM MCU uh, with only half a megabyte of, of RAM. And so this has been uh, quite challenging to make CFS uh, fit in, in this. Um, so I, either having an, 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 an example of a low RAM configuration for C C CFS or having simple uh, a text um, optimization guide uh, would be very, very useful to yeah, know which configuration uh, to, to tune in, in order to, to reduce a bit uh, the RAM uh, usage. Um, then the next challenging point we, we encountered is the ground to flight uh, interface, so how to make sure that the telecommands and telemetries match between uh, what is flying and, and what's on, on the ground. Um, our current approach, so we, we tried a, a few things, and our current approach is to use Python as a, as a source of truth um, and using the C types and struct uh, modules. Um, this, of course, is still a, a bit complex, but thanks to Python, uh, it's quite flexible and, and we can uh, do a lot of things. So in, in our case, we generate uh, C and header files. We generate uh, the CFS schedule and housekeeping ta uh, ta tables. We also have the TMTC disk serializer to yeah, write the data into InfluxDB or uh, encode the te telecommands. And finally, we also ge generate some uh, documentation. And uh, this approach allows us to have some validation of the whole set of telecommands and te uh, telemetries. And so we can check for the uniqueness of the message uh, IDs, check for duplicates or uh, really any other or, or any other checks that we, we might need. Um, on the ground system inter interface, we, we also explored a few things and um, none of them was really uh, satisfying. And so we settled on uh, using just basic Python scripts and then uh, Grafana for the, for the visualization and uh, Jupyter for the, for the telecommand deal. Um, this is mostly used for dev development and AIT. And for the actual uh, flight, we will use a com uh, commercial uh, MCS. Um, then we wanted to tell a few words about the main applications that, that we use. Um, in the interest of time, I will focus more on the on the scheduler, uh, but we have a few backup slides uh, on, on the housekeeping and the software bus network uh, applications. Um, so first of all, a little word about the, the applications in general. So the CFS applications that we can see um, have a lot of work going on and many merge requests being, being merged. Um, but they also seem to be a bit out of, this, of the main CFS uh, cycle. 
Uh, either they don't compile sometimes or a lot of merge requests uh, can be left uh, open without any feedback. Um, and so we think that maybe having a monorepo approach would help at least catch the, um, the compilation uh, issues. Um, so the scheduler, as I said, we we spend a, a bit of time to um, let's say to adapt to to adapt the scheduler app to our needs. Um, so the scheduler is driven by CFS messages, which is um, yeah, quite 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 elegant and works quite well. Um, but the configuration is um, a hard coded list of CFS messages, um, and that makes it very coupled to the CFS message. Uh, Structure. Um, for, for, for example, in, in our case, we enabled the extended uh, CCSS uh, header, and we found out that some some fields were not set. So we we had to call CFE message in it um, to make sure that everything was was set as we as we expected. Um, so a more lightweight uh, configuration table would uh, actually not have the whole message, but just the message ID, the function code, and an optional uh, payload. And that would make the, the configuration a bit less uh, verbose. Finally, um, something that is not a, a big problem for our first mission, um, but maybe in the future, our customers might have a stronger uh, re requirements on, on, on this. Um, the current uh, way of building a scheduler uh, configuration is uh, quite uh, tedious and error prone and there are no tools to to perform any any schedulability uh, study of the of the schedule um, so having a dedicated a dedicated tool would uh, would be quite uh, quite valuable um, finally we wanted to try to highlight a few proposals which we think would uh, help met, make cfs uh, better and easier to to use um, so we will yeah, go over three three main uh, points. First, uh, the build system, um, as you as you understood, it's it was quite a quite a big um, challenge for us. Um, so we think that having a single system to make CFS usable both as a as a framework or a library would uh, would be uh, beneficial, um, and also to reduce the number of CMEC macro and uh, and uh, and functions because the current uh, CMEC system is quite uh, quite complex um, and the question is where to put the complexity and we think that putting it into into a scripting language like Python uh, would make it more maintainable than uh, having it in CMEC. The second point is about the repository so OSAL, PSP and CFE are all spread into three different uh, repositories and having CFS as a single mono repository, uh, we think would uh, improve uh, a bit the user experience. Um, and also including the important apps um, that is most likely used in any CFS uh, system would, would also save some time to set up uh, CFS at, at the beginning. And lastly, also compi compiling and testing every, everything with every release uh, cycle would uh, catch um, at least the compilation uh, issues and, and probably a lot of basic uh, issues. And lastly, the centra 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 centralization. Um, so CFS feels uh, quite scattered and there could be some um, centralization of tooling, configuration or documentation to, um, to harmonize a bit uh, CFS as a, as a whole. Um, to conclude, we think that CFS is a great uh, framework and reference for flight software development, um, but it's definitely not easy to set up and use without any, any modifications. So in our case, we adopted CFS by changing whatever was uh, needed to fit our need. Uh, but at the same time, we, we, we try to stay compatible with uh, upstream to, of course, be, to, be, to to benefit from the updates, but also to give back to the to the to the community with, for the changes that we that we might uh, make. And uh, finally, we are always curious to to hear what the CFS team thinks about our feedback, and uh, we are happy to um, yeah continue the discussion and provide more feedback as we gain more experience. So as this is a recorded talk, sadly there are no uh, QA. 
but feel free to uh, get in touch and we will be happy to to discuss uh, in more details.